Before I begin, let me offer up a quick thank you to the unholy overlord god queen of YouTube, Empress Susan, whose algorithm noticed my recent video. I'll admit I was hesitant about sacrificing live animals to a cosmic deity in exchange for YouTube clout, but I suppose it's good to know how many chickens I need to murder in order to get 200k on my videos. It's eight, by the way. But jokes aside, my recent video about Halo in other games performed really well, but a lot of people were concerned, frustrated, and even confused that I missed some games out. And I know it may not seem like it, but I did do that intentionally. I, I didn't specify it in the video, so it's my own fault, but it was never meant to be a full comprehensive list of Halo appearing in every other game. Just a few that I had personally picked up on. Now, I'm not expecting this video to do as well as my last, but you guys were really passionate about some of the games that I missed out, so I'm gonna do my best to add as many as I can to the list, no matter how big or small. Absolutely unacceptable! Killer Instinct is a series of fighting games originally created and developed by Rare. It started with the appropriately titled Killer Instinct back in October of 1994. The game was followed by a sequel two years later, with the sequel then being modified into a spin-off title for the Nintendo 64. The series is widely known for having a colourful cast of fighters for each game, and in 2013 a reboot of Killer Instinct was released to the Xbox One. At launch, this iteration featured several characters, mostly from older titles, but as time went on, more and more characters were added from different franchises. This included characters like General Ram from the Gears of War franchise, Rash from the Battletoads franchise, and of course our very own Arbiter from the Halo franchise. What's interesting about the Arbiter in this game is that along with his unique fighting style, he comes complete with a decent range of unlockable cosmetics. We have the primary armor sets from both Halo 5 Guardians and Halo 2 Anniversary of course, but along with those we get some armor sets transitioned from older games. These costumes range from the Commander and Storm sets, both from Halo 4 and 5, the Ascetic set from Halo 3, the Supreme Commander set from Halo 2 Anniversary, and finally the Zealot and Ranger class sets from Halo Reach. And if that wasn't cool enough, just like with Dead or Alive, Killer Instinct features a Halo themed arena based on one of the best looking locations in Halo 5, Sang Helios. If I had to offer up just one tiny criticism though, it would be the Arbiter's voice. I realise that Keith David may have been too expensive to hire or just unavailable due to other commitments, but the voice doesn't sound like a convincing take in my opinion. Another victory, yes, but there is always another battle. Other than that, it's a great way to represent Halo in yet another fighting game. It's common knowledge that Bungie were the original custodians of Halo, but felt the need to move on to different projects, leaving creative control of the franchise to 343 Industries. During that weird transition, I was always curious about Bungie ever having any kind of future or connection to Halo. Obviously they legally couldn't do anything, but there's nothing illegal about references, parodies and easter eggs. In fact, there were even references to Bungie's destiny back in Halo 3 ODST with several posters scattered around New Mombasa which 343 then had to remove from the MCC version of the game. Time went on, Destiny launched. Everything seemed really calm on the easter eggs and references front, save for a few similarly designed weapons and characters. But as you progress through the main story and reach Mars, you can find yourself in this area of the map, where you'll likely encounter several Cabal forces guarding a small outpost. Upon dispatching the enemies and looking back at the outpost, you can see the familiar silhouette of Master Chief's Mjolnir helmet. It's not exactly the most subtle reference to Halo, but still cool nonetheless. The Forza series has included Halo, to my knowledge, twice now. One was back in 2011 with an entertaining video featuring former Top Gear host Jeremy Clarkson who talked about the Warthog. If I can recall correctly, this video served as both promotional material for Halo 4 as well as a reveal of sorts for 343's interpretation of the Warthog. And if my memory is also correct, you couldn't actually drive it. I've never played Forza 4 and I couldn't find any gameplay of it being driven, so I'm gonna assume that was correct. But feel free to let me know if that's not the case. But fast forward to 2018, it was announced that Forza Horizon 4 would have a drivable Warthog and a Halo themed mission to go along with it. Racing games aren't really my kind of thing, I can't drive in them to save my life, and honestly I found playing through FH4 to be a bit of a slog, mostly because before you can access the Halo mission event you need to reach level 20. Your time may vary, but it took me a few hours to reach that point. That being said, when I finally did unlock it, I was blown away. I hadn't really looked at gameplay of the mission prior, so I went into this almost completely blind. Obviously Forza Horizon 4 itself is a very attractive game. 
and rather than just sticking a warthog into a generic racetrack through the English countryside, you're given a track with a custom skybox that adds a halo ring and a covenant ship. There are covenant assets littered throughout the race itself, you're followed by a pelican throughout the duration of the race, and all the while Cortana is delivering a narration reminiscent of dialogue from Halo games. I found this one to be extremely well done and had to play it a few times just to appreciate the work put in. Another nice touch is that your driver will be replaced with the Master Chief and several other drivers will appear on the track with names like Chips Duggo and Pete Stacker. The whole thing was yet again another great way to showcase Halo in a different genre. Pilot, this would be a very good time to leave. I want credit for this one, not for the discovery of the reference, because the reference itself is very in your face. I mean, I would just like some credit for playing this game because... Damn, it's not good. Duke Nukem Forever is the newest, and if the performance of this game is anything to go by, probably the last major game in the Duke Nukem franchise. Originally working as a 2D platformer, the series evolved over time into what is generally defined as a shooter these days. In fact, along with Doom and Wolfenstein, Duke Nukem 3D is considered to be a key driving force in the popularization of first-person shooters. The direct sequel to Duke Nukem 3D wouldn't be released for many years and was stuck in development hell before it eventually released in 2000. 2011. Duke Nukem Forever would come along with a slew of references and spoofs, and on the mission Vegas in Ruin, Halo got a not-so-subtle reference. You start by meeting up with your old friend Dylan, and immediately after that you head on down to this van containing a clearly Halo 3-inspired armor set. If the look alone wasn't enough to tip it off, there's a brief musical bumper that plays something similar to the Halo theme, along with some humorous dialogue from Duke about the integrity and philosophy behind owning a multi-billion dollar suit of power armor. Duke, we've got your green power armor over here and ready to go. Power armor is for pussies. Something I would like to note here though is that while I was doing research for this video I found a few articles talking about this easter egg dating back as far as February of 2011, while the game itself didn't launch until June 2011 depending on your region. In these articles you can see clear images of the armor in the van, but it looks a lot different to what you can see in the final game, with the pre-launch set looking far more Halo 3 like. My guess is that Gearbox were either forced to change it or realised that the set looked a bit too close to the official Mark VI armor to the point where there could be legal issues, so they axed some of that detail. Still cool though. We all know about Minecraft, there's no real reason for me to talk about the game because we know what it is. You spawn in, you break things, you get bored, and then you come back about six months later. The cycle repeats. When Minecraft was bought out by Microsoft, things began to change for the game as far as downloadable content was concerned. There were a slew of cosmetic packs becoming available, both for skins and changes to the map itself. One such pack was the Halo mashup pack, releasing in May 2014. Like most other packs at the time, it featured a complete overhaul of the textures, mobs, and other bits and pieces like tools. But hands down, the coolest thing about this pack is that it takes several well-known locations and maps from Halo and recreates them. Some are only partial recreations, like the Silent Cartographer, which has a fully remade exterior but only a partially remade interior, and others are completely remade multiplayer maps like Sand Trap. Blood Gulch, Blackout, Guardian, and Valhalla. Along with those features, the pack gives players a decent amount of skins to wear, with most of the mobs being replaced with enemies and creatures from Halo. A personal favourite would have to be the mower being a replacement for chickens. There's also a mini-adventure that you can do where you have to activate certain parts of each map, which will in turn disable a gate leading to the nether where the Didact Cryptum can be found. If you manage to get inside the Cryptum, you can activate the stacks of TNT and complete the mini-adventure by destroying the Didact. There's still plenty to explore in the pack though, so if you've never owned it or just haven't played Minecraft in a while, pick it up and give it a try. One of my favourite games to play with friends is Sea of Thieves, and it too was given a nifty Halo reference. Part of the fun of this game are the cosmetics, admittedly lacking in some areas but still very nice. The two main forms of customization in Sea of Thieves are for player characters and the ships themselves, and in August of this year, Sea of Thieves developer Rare announced that during the week of Gamescom, between the dates of August 20th to the 24th, anybody who played the game would be eligible to unlock a free Halo-themed ship cosmetic. Sea of Thieves to date features three main ship classes, the Sloop for 1-2 to two players, the Brigantine for 2-3 to three players, and the Galleon for 3-4 to four players. And with the free Halo Cosmetics pack, you'll be given the Spartan Figurehead, the Spartan Hull, the Spartan Sails, the Spartan Wheel, the Spartan Cannons, and finally, the Spartan Capstan. You can equip these to whatever kind of ship you want to set sail on and represent the Halo franchise while you're sinking enemy ships. Your experience sinking enemy ships may vary, I know that mine does. Well, that's where I'm going to end this video, but before I do, allow me to throw out some honourable mentions that I didn't forget about, I just couldn't think of much to say about them since their references are relatively small.
then uh, you're a space marine on a ring-shaped planet, and, uh... <laughs> no, no, no. And with those honourable mentions out of the way, let me take a quick time to thank my current patrons, including Gamer Chat, Jay Laughlin, Curry Chan, Paul Prospero, Rainbow Dawn, Rook, Rowzilla42, Sammy A. Nielsen, and Wolfric Productions. And a huge thank you to everyone who's shown interest in the channel recently. And now, since I never have a good way to end these videos, here's a tragic clip from Bionicle The Mask of Light. Takoro has gone, Liwa. Buried by the very lava that sustained it. Tahu. <gasps>